Hello, everybody. I want to start by saying thank you for having me here today. Thanks for being a great audience for everybody else so far. Uh, and thanks to Sylvan for the introduction. So as, as Sylvan mentioned, I am the maintainer of React right now. And so unsurprisingly, I will be talking to you today about React. Uh, today, we're going to focus more on the historical context of how React came to be, talk about where we are, and then talk about where we're going. So brief overview. For, for those who don't know, what is React? React is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. Simple statement. More specifically, it fits into the V of MVC. And this isn't strictly true as the borders of MVC start to get a little fuzzy, but generally speaking, this is where it fits. OK, so where did React come from? Who here has seen or read the Da Vinci Code? Couple people, yeah. So we all know that Leonardo da Vinci was a member of a secret society tasked with protecting the secret of the Holy Grail. But that's obviously crazy, right? What if it's not? Yeah. Uh, so after years of working on large code bases with complicated implicit data relationships, uh, an intrepid young developer by the name of Jordan Walk went looking for answers. After lots of research and the right Photoshop filter, <laughs> we, we get to react. Really? Really? No, no. That'd be pretty crazy, right? So the history of React actually starts several years ago uh, with something called XHP. XHP is an extension to PHP that we wrote at Facebook that allows you to embed XML in your PHP. Kind of crazy, because we all love XML, right? Uh, so we use this to, to build up our views. And it looks something like this. This is very, very reminiscent of uh, XHTML. Uh, but the beauty of it was that it was an extensible system. So it was possible to wrap up reusable pieces of markup and refer to them with a single line of code. So this is a real example of what we have in our code base. We have this namespaced component. and it's just XML. You can see you pass a UID just of whatever friend you want to add a button for. And we refer to this as a whole just as a component. And when you render it, it looks something like this. Obviously, there's a little bit more going on than just some simple HTML. So an interesting thing came out of this. Instead of each page fetching all of the data it needs up front and then passing it all down to a template, each component became responsible for the data it accepted as arguments, and then further, the data it would fetch before rendering. So in this case, an add friends button actually needs to know a lot about the relationship between the current viewer, that ID, or more specifically, the user that, represent, that is represented by that ID, and how that relationship all fits. And so with server rendering, you only ever send data down the tree. Each component at a lower point is responsible for its own data. And that data never goes back up the tree. So this is an important concept. So out of XHP, we came out with two really important things. The first of these is reusable components. That add friends button could be put anywhere on any page, and it would look exactly the same. The other part is explicit data flow and ownership. OK, but enough about PHP. Let's talk about JavaScript. That's why we're here. So historically, we always use JavaScript pretty sparingly at Facebook. This is, yeah, there's a long history there. But the, the important thing is we moved on. And so a few years ago, we were working on an ads product. And we wanted to make this really interactive desktop-like app. So this is what it looks like today. I was on hotel Wi-Fi, so it's a little bit laggy. Uh, so we wrote it primarily with JavaScript, obviously, and as what tends to happen, you, you end up with libraries built around uh, common functionality. Uh, and one thing that we really focused on was components. This idea of components was important to us at Facebook. So we did that. But the other thing that's really popular with JavaScript libraries is data binding, where you have a reference to an object, and when you change a property on that object, it goes and mutates every other instance of that object, and then your page refreshes. Out of this, this library, we have 
Again, this reusable components concept. We stuck strong with that. But we sort of lost this second point. Instead of explicit data flow and ownership, you have these objects that are owned by who knows who. And when you mutate them, it mutates other parts of your page. And all of this is implicit, so you don't really understand what's going on. So Jordan Walk from our DaVinci story. He is St. Thomas, I guess. Uh, so he took a step back after working on this app and realized that with these implicit updates, not only was it really hard to follow the data flow, but you ended up updating large parts of your page often. So this resulted in a lot of DOM manipulations, and it was all hidden behind this implicit data relationship. So he wanted to clean this up, so he took, up, took inspiration from server-side rendering and functional programming. It took a couple attempts. The first version of React was actually written in SNL. Uh, for those of you who don't know, SNL is a crazy academic functional programming language that nobody ever uses in real products. Maybe one person. Uh, so, but the problem with SML is it's purely functional. There's, there's no concept of a DOM or a browser. So you can't really use this. Uh, but out of it, the, the core concepts of this data relationship came. Next up, he used a framework called Hacks, which didn't end up working out. Um, and eventually, JavaScript. And the original version was very, it was good. It just wasn't great. So there was a lot of, a lot of disbelief amongst people that, that this idea would even work. Uh, and when we open sourced, we saw a lot of that from people outside. When I joined the team, I was like, there's no way this works. But eventually, Jordan got enough mind share, got enough people helping him out, and worked on improving the compatibility and the other pieces. So we have reusable components. We have explicit data flow and ownership. Great. Those are the two things we wanted. And the third thing that came out of this was also the virtual DOM. This is something we've talked a lot about in the past, but we actually think it's the least interesting part of React. And it's more or less a side effect of how the first two parts of this needed to work. So then we shipped it. First in ads, and then to the average user in newsfeed, more and more across the, the Facebook website, and then we open sourced it. So where is React today? At Facebook, we have nearly 10,000 components. This is a lot. <laughs> uh, so we use it every day, from user-facing code to internal tools to random little scripts. Yeah. So we also use it for a piece of the mobile website uh, and our open source projects as well. A few other people use it. Uh, so, or Julian was up here earlier talking about how Yahoo is starting to use it. Uh, there are some other companies on here that, that are pretty, pretty big. Not too big. Netflix, that small one that, that Joe was talking about. So the other thing I want to talk about where we are today is open source. Uh, we've been historically kind of bad at open source at Facebook. And even within React, we've kind of been a little half open source. A lot of discussions and decisions were made behind closed doors. Uh, code was landed internally at Facebook and then exported to the repo. And while we maintained history, there was no way for the community to comment on these things before the decision was made. So we've been working on being a lot better. For the past month, two months, all of our changes have gone to GitHub first via pull requests, even people on the, the core internal team and other people at Facebook. This is hard for many of us. but. We're working on it. So where is React headed? This is sort of the more interesting area to me, at least. Uh, there are a few big ideas in here. Uh, some of this will be a part of 1.0. Some of it won't. I'm not going to tell you which parts are which, because then that will, someone will hold me to it. So first up, we're on a slow march to 1.0. And right now, we're at version 0.12. And version numbers are rather arbitrary, but they, we've been slowly moving towards this stable 1.0. Uh, and over the last 18 months, we've taken a lot of time to figure out what that means, both for our use internally at Facebook, but also what everybody else in the community is starting to do. So we've been solidifying the core concepts, working on 
communication with the ideas. Uh, and as a part of that, API stabilization and reduction is super important. Uh, one of my colleagues, Sebastian, he just gave a talk at JSConf about our philosophy about APIs. And the, the biggest thing here is we don't want APIs. We want as few as possible. So we're piggybacking on language features. And the result of this is that there's lower cognitive overhead for people who are new to your code base, for people who work on a new part of the code base, and just in general, for anybody who's reading your code. And if you think about it, we really spend just as much, if not more time, reading code. I know I don't get to write much code these days, so readability is super important. But we also know we've made mistakes, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so language, the language that we write is JavaScript. There are other libraries. Uh, John David Dalton gave a talk a few minutes ago about Lodash. Lodash is great. But we also really like language features that are native. They're really easy for everybody to learn because we're all writing this. Other libraries have more things to learn before you can really get productive. So we at Facebook, are, we're members of the TC39 committee, or TC39, uh, and we are actively participating in the standardization of new language features, as well as giving feedback about ones that are in process. And we've invested really heavily in this. We have pipelines for transforming code from ES6, ES7, whatever comes next, into code that can run in your browser. And we've actually had some fun, fun mishaps here because browsers don't always implement things the right way. Uh, but this has given us the opportunity to provide feedback on developing standards. Uh, where possible, we polyfill. And where not possible, we do static code transforms. So one of these that we're incorporating to React whole, like, as much as possible, as soon as possible, is ES6 classes. This is how you create a React component today. Now, you call this method react.createClass, and you pass in an object with a few methods. Now, it's not exactly clear what's happening behind the scenes. What does createClass return? Is it a constructor? Just a regular function? Can you use instance of? Pro tip, you can't. Uh, and what other implicit things are happening? One other thing we do is uh, automatic binding of, of your methods, so that since you're not obviously getting a constructor. You don't really know what this is inside an object blob. So we, we make sure we bind all of that. But moving forward, what we want to do is this. You can see we're taking advantage of this class keyword that's new in ES6. Uh, and we may extend some base component. We may be able to get away with not doing that. And we've actually just landed initial support for this. It's still a little sketchy. Doesn't quite work for all use cases, but for rudimentary ca cases, you can do things like this. That'll come out in 0 0.13, and as we move forward, we'll solidify how exactly you can get to writing this code. CSS and JavaScript. Uh, some of you may have seen a talk one, another one of my colleagues gave, uh, Christopher Chedeau, who is French, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is, his slides are online. There isn't enough time to go into all the details. It was a 20 minute talk, so here's the, the one or two minute version. With building components, what you end up with, even if you use React, you still have multiple files that you need to open to determine what a component looks like. CSS lives in its CSS file, and even if you have namespace CSS without, classing, without clashing class names, you still end up having to look in multiple places. So the idea here is that maybe we could put them all in one place. We got a lot of shit when we open source React for putting your view with your logic. So since we already got the shit, let's just take it further. <laughs> We're gonna put your style sheets in your JavaScript too. And one, one really cool advantage that you get out of this is that you have not only one file, but it's much easier to distribute your components. You don't have to tell, there's obviously a pipeline you need, but you don't have to tell consumers that they need to include this style sheet, this JavaScript file, to make it work. So 
here's how it might look. And it's, it's relatively boring. Uh, you've been able to write CSS or modify styles of an element from JavaScript for a long time. So all we've done here is codify how you might do it. And we can do some static analysis, pull out this styles.container so that we aren't really going and setting individual styles on every modification. Web workers. For those of you who aren't familiar, this basically just gives you threads in JavaScript. And so in theory, you can do these really expensive calculations off the main thread and leave the, the main thread there so that the user can scroll the page smoothly. Then there's this communication between the threads and you update the page. You run, you take that, that message back. So we're exploring how we might take advantage of this to speed up React. As some of you know, React has this diffing algorithm. It might be worth it to do that diffing off the main thread, send the, the diff in some way back to the main thread, and do those, those minimal manipulations there. Layout and animations are hard problems, especially when you're trying to do them declaratively. We haven't solved them. So if, if any of you are wizards, come help us. Uh, we've been learning as much as possible from other projects, uh, Pop on iOS, Rebound on Android, some other open source projects to see where we might draw some inspiration. Um, these are obviously really critical things to solve in real world applications, uh, especially on mobile. So we're working on them. What we have today is sort of a half solution, but we want to be better. And the last big thing I wanted to cover, I said earlier that React is the V in MVC. So this leaves the M and C for people to go figure out themselves. Uh, and for many people, that actually works. Uh, it's allow, I think it's actually contributed a lot to our success as a project, because people can integrate React piecemeal into their own thing. But there's a reason projects like Ember and Angular are really popular. They're both excellent projects, but one thing people don't think a lot about is how much having a package solution really helps you get your shit done. Uh, if you have to spend half your time figuring out which router to use, do I use Meteor, Firebase, Parse? What are my models? Does Backbone work? These are all things that maybe you shouldn't have to figure out. I don't know if we'll necessarily have a single framework, but it's an important area for us to explore, especially as the community grows. And a bunch of other things. Testing, documentation, a lot of community-related work. These are all important things, so if you want to help us, we're on GitHub. Thanks.